singing. You may be seated. As you're seated, we'll take about seven minutes, I think, for questions, if you have any. I've had a couple people text me this week, and I think I've answered them. We had child-rearing questions, marital questions this week. I had a couple financial questions this week. Uh, does anybody have one? You say, I'm embarrassed. Somebody always has to start it off when we do it. Who has the first? Right here, Carol. I'm sorry, I hear the boys were playing basketball, and we got a couple dents on your vehicle. We'll get that worked out. Yeah, I know, but I, I apologize for that. Yes, ma'am. What happens when before you get married, you talk about the rules that you have for child rearing and the direction you want your kids to go, and then somewhere after marriage, one of the mates decides to change them without talking to the other? Is that the question? <sighs> right. I will say this. The, that oftentimes happens when we blend homes together. And I say that because when my wife and I, when we had our children, uh, we, we talked about where we wanted them to go, but we redevelop rules all the time. Uh, for instance, Madeline's now nine, and she has uh, different ideas of things. And, but then all of a sudden, we had a boy. So we have nine, seven, two girls. Now i got a three-year-old son. And between uh, nine and three, obviously, is six. So there's six years difference, but a boy is totally different. And what happens is my wife and I are growing up with all three of these. We have seen them from infancy. We know every trait that they have. We know their good traits. We know their bad traits. We know which of our three are the most sneaky, which are the most honest, and which don't know really which they are, so they try to be both and fail at it. And we know the whiny ones. I looked at one tonight. Meredith is a... Oh, how do you say it? Mary is a dramatic, overdramatic person. So tonight, her food was hot, and she touched the plate and went, oh, 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 it burned me. I said, take a drink of water and stop whining. Well, water is not going to fix a burned finger, but she took a drink of water, and guess what? She stopped whining. <laughs> and I looked at her. I said, I don't deal with whiners. I said, I do not know. I do not like whining. But that's been our principle in our home since they were young. Here's what happens when you bring two homes together. And I'm not, I'm not defeating you. I'm trying to give you some counsel on this. You bring two homes together. You've got a mother who's grown up with her children. You've got a father who's grown up with his children. And then all of a sudden you have uh, uh, maybe a child together. You have already two totally different probably philosophies because no parent is, no parental group is the same. And so when we bring those together, we start dating and we start talking, but a, a father is going to be less apt to discipline the mother's ch children more so than he is quick to punish his own children. And the same with mom, because we're scared to overstep boundaries. And we say, well, there are no boundaries. Yeah, here's what I find in counseling. Oftentimes, a mother or father when the wife is at her wits end with her children, she's ready to let dad do absolutely anything with them. Beat them to death. I don't care. Put them in a box and ship them with the Kessels to Africa. You know, and, and we're at our wits. But then tomorrow morning they wake up. Well, I think you spanked them too hard. I think they sat in time out for too long. And the, the, the dad's like, seriously, woman? I won't put you in a box and send you to Africa. And, and we, we've, got, we've got these things that we think are hashed out until our emotions take over. Another thing that happens is when one has lower standards than the other. When you have a higher standard for your child uh, than your mate has, that causes great confusion in the home. As a matter of fact, that will cause a child to completely shut down. That will cause a child to wonder who's loved more, who's loved less. Uh, that, that causes animosity between children. So sometimes to curb that, we try to explain why rules are different. And kids do not work that way. If the rules are good enough for us, why aren't they good enough for everybody? As a matter of fact, that's how adults think. And we try to teach our children to live in a world that we don't even accept. Why can a police officer drive 50 miles an hour down German Hill Road, but I have to drive 30 or get a ticket? Those are the things we think. 
And we, we look at our society sometimes and we're trying to figure out, well, where's the problem in children? Inconsistency is the greatest problem in children. So here's how to deal with that when they start changing it. You've got to keep the lines of communication open. And when they're so hard-headed maybe and they don't want to listen, uh, then maybe uh, seek some counsel and say, hey, can we talk to pastor about this or can we, can we open this up? And uh, you'll be surprised God will use things to wake them up, but communication is really the way. And have good reasons. Communication is not yelling and screaming at each other. And that's sometimes how we want to start a conversation. And I'll tell you, I, I have people approach me very gruffly, and I'm very gruff in my response. Why? Because I am not going to let somebody talk to me and, and yell at me when I didn't create the problem. And they come at me, and I'll immediately, pow! And, I'll, and then all of a sudden, we can go down, but I'm not going to let you watch me escalate. Because the escalation means I'm losing my temper, and I'm not going to lose my temper. But I will, I will do everything I can to control that, that conversation from the very beginning, my very first statement, and then bring us down to some rationalization. I've had to do it in counseling. Married couples will come in, and the husband will start talking, and the wife starts talking over him. And I say, hey, woman, sit there and be quiet till I ask you to talk. And she'll say, <laughs> and then she'll start talking. Said, I said, be quiet for a minute. And I'll look at the husband, and I said, see, you can't even get her to be quiet. And I'll say, that's the greatest problem here. And I've done that to husbands, too, and they're trying to talk over the wife. And I'll say, hey, pal, you came to me. Now be quiet. And he'll say, but I said, be quiet or get out. And all of a sudden, somebody has to control a situation that's out of control. And once we get that, now husband and wife's in the home, you can't really talk to each other like that. Woman, pastor said for you to shut up. Eh, that didn't really go over well, did it? She's ready to beat you with a pot. <laughs> You've got to start conversations off rationally. Honey, can we, can we maybe talk about some, some of the problems that we're having with the kids? Not a text. Honey, we need to talk when you get home. All these exclamation points. I don't do that. I do not do those type text messages. People send it to me all the time. And they'll say, Pastor, I need you to call me. And I'll say, about what? I'm not going to let you go, make me go through my day wondering what in the world we're talking about. Are you kidding me? I've got plenty of things to worry about. And if I offended you on a Sunday or if you've got an issue you just can't control, let me help you, but tell me why. Because with that why, it helps me prioritize what part of my day I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, take to call you. Especially when I've got a man who's about ready to go in for open heart surgery. I've got a little baby who's diagnosed with leukemia. I've got a teenager whose uh, uh, mother died. And you, your, your problem is, my wife, she just won't vacuum the house. And I'm like, seriously, dude, I'll call you at midnight. You understand? So we've, we've got to learn how to talk to people. That, that is crucial even in our society. Learn how to talk to each other. Who has the next question? Who has the next question? Come on, I know we have more. Don't leave Carol hanging. Who's got it? Child rearing, finances, Bible. Anybody have one? Anybody? I see your hand. Yes, ma'am. Ooh, that's a great question. That, as a matter of fact, is a question that's been debated throughout the ages. Some believe that the apostles are ones who saw the risen Christ, and that's the definition that they go with. Others believe that an apostle is one who is establishing a work for God in an area where there is no current work for God. And that's where I have found uh, throughout my pastorate that some believe the, uh, the gift of apostleship is still there. For instance, there are some missionaries that would call themselves apostles because they're going to a country where there is no work. And when you look at the apostles, a lot of them were going to places where there was nothing established. We look, as we find in the scriptures, those who are referred to as apostles in the Bible are the, those who had seen the risen Christ. And some would ask, how did the apostle Paul see him uh, on the road to Damascus? Uh, when he called him Lord, he saw the risen Christ. And so I would, I would tend to yield with that idea. I do not believe that apostles still exist today. I believe that was a gift that was given for a very specific reason at a very uh, specific point in the early church so that there was uh, leadership, but there was a credibility that they had that we don't have today. And so that's, I believe that would be the difference. So any other questions? Any other questions? I see movement, people scratching their noses. Right over here, yes, Amy. Do 
No, as a matter of fact, you're violating two laws of God. One where it says, oh, no man, anything. Now, I don't know if that's what you did or if you asked on behalf of somebody else, but um, you're violating two laws of God. And I'll show you the one. Would you turn with me to Leviticus? That's a good question. If you didn't hear, she said, if you spent your money that was supposed to be for tithe on something else, and then you borrowed money from uh, a friend to tithe, and then you don't pay them back, is that wrong? Well, yes, it's wrong on both sides. Number one, the Bible says, owe no man anything. We should not go to a brother for a loan. And by the way, you should never loan money unless you're giving it. That's Bible. If you loan money, the Bible teaches you expect it not to be repaid. Just give it. If they pay back, it's a bonus. But what happens is you loan money to somebody and say, all right, I want it back. And when they don't pay, you know what you think every time you see them? Jerk. <laughs> now all of a sudden you don't like them. You should have just given it. It should be a gift. And that's why you ought to be careful in this idea of loaning. Even for family, co-signing loans, you're going to be left with it. There's a reason why people's credit's bad. And so don't let your love get you in a bind. So we come to this idea of tithing, the first fruits. Now I'm looking at you, but I'm teaching everybody. We are to tithe. You, many blessings for tithing throughout the Bible, uh, specifically written in Malachi chapter 3. However, we come to Leviticus chapter 27 and verse number 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Verse 31. And if a man will at all redeem aught of his tithes. Okay, look at me. Look at me. Okay, here we go. If a man shall at all redeem aught of his tithe, my tithe, let's say my tithe is $50, but my kids need shoes, and I've got three kids, and that totals $50, and I say, well, God will understand I'm using these 50 for my children. God says, eh, wrong answer. It's holy to God. It all belongs to him. So I have redeemed aught. I have used my tithe for something that I need, saying that God's not good enough or big enough or powerful enough to provide my need, so I am going to help him with his money. Now, doesn't make sense, does it? So I take that $50 and I redeem aught of tithe. He shall add thereto a fifth part thereof. This is God's interest plan. Like you have credit cards with 24% uh, uh, interest. I mean, you try to have the 0.09% interest at all, or the 9% interest. You try to get it low. Man, I got a credit card with 2.9. Then all of a sudden, after the year's up, it jumped to 24%. And you're like, you got to be kidding me. Or you go in, and it's uh, one year, same as cash. And you get to the 13th month, guess what? Now what's on the bill is 12 months of interest that all built up, slams you on that 13 month, uh, 13th month, and you're all of a sudden at a 24% interest rate and wondering how in the world did my $1,000 bill go to like 2000 Because it's compounded interest. And we look and God says, I have an interest plan too. You're to add a fifth part to. Well, what are we adding a fifth part to? A hundred. So what's a fifth of a hundred? Somebody help me. Twenty. Twenty percent interest. It's, this is the Bible, right, that we have? Okay. So these are God's word. And concerning the tithe of the herd, of the flock, even of whatsoever passes under the rod, the tenth shall be holy. Oh, there's the tenth. You know what tithe means? Tenth. You say, well, that's Old Testament. It was given with the law. As a matter of fact, it was given to Abraham far before the law. As a matter of fact, you go into the New Testament, the same word tithe still means, oh yeah. So we find a tenth is a tithe. Ten percent of what? Net or gross? Well, why? Well, what's the answer? Why, why can't I tithe off my net? That's what I live off of, Gordon McCain. Why, why do I have to tithe off my gross? Well, yeah, but... But my gross is like sometimes $200 more than my net. So what is the answer? Oh, hold on. It's easy to say the bigger number because that pleases God. But here's the answer. Jesus himself said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. Does the government tax you off your net or your gross? Right. The only reason you have a net versus gross is because the government took part of your gross. 
So we tithe off the gross because if the government gets off the gross, God should get off the gross. Well, all of a sudden, that just increased my, increased my tithe by like 25 bucks. And then we get to the thing, we always, we always try and rationalize why we don't have to give God money. Now here at Calvary Baptist Church, I don't think we have that problem. You're all giving, giving, giving all the time. But you've got to remember, an offering is different than a tithe. We're raising $1,000. We're asking for money for this uh, video system, $25,000. It's wrong of you to redeem aught with your tithe. You give, uh, you, you say, well, all right, I'm going to use my tithe for the next uh, month for that video system. No, you just made it an offering. A tithe is a non-designated amount. It's your 10% just given to God for the work of his ministry. An offering is what I give to missions. An offering is what I give to a video system. An offering is what I give to the Kretzman family. An offering is what I'm going to be given to the orphanage. An offering is what I give by way of a love offering for a family. That's not my tithe. If you take that 10% and designate it down for something that you think is more important, you just made it an offering. You understand? Yes, up and down for yes, side to side for no. Okay? So we look, and God's talking about your tithe here. Now, with that tithe, he says, if you redeem aught with your tithe, you owe 20% more. So let's use a round number, $100. So if I, my tithe is $100 every week, and I used my tithe this week for something that I needed, I owe God how much next week? 120 plus my other 100. 220. If you get paid weekly. If you get paid bi weekly, then tithe bi weekly. If you get paid monthly, uh, I, I, uh, I tell people just tithe monthly. And some say, it says weekly, bring it to the weekly. Well, we, it's a little different system now. I mean, you're not going out to your flock and killing a cow and bringing it to the, to the house of God. We're not doing that anymore. Some get paid weekly, some bi weekly, some monthly. But does that help? Does that, does that explain it? Uh, for you in a little bit more detail. Yes, Miss Mel? Uh huh. Yes, therein lies a good question. We've now tithed off the gross, and then I've got income tax that's returning. So since I tithe off the gross, do I still give 10% on my tax return? My wife and I do for fear because there's confusion when it comes to this. I tithe off anything that I, didn't, that I have today that I didn't have yesterday. To me, that's increase. So uh, let's, let's say I get $1,000 back in my taxes. To me, I'm going to give God 100 That's tithe. I'd rather be safe than sorry. If it ends up in heaven being an offering, I'm good. But then my wife and I start uh, saying, okay, well, we're asking people for $1,000, so we've got to now give 1000 We're working on the 1000 aside from that. Now, you may have a different opinion. That would be called a gray area. You are tithing off your gross, and then you're saying, okay, this is just money. It was mine already. I've already tithed off of it, and I can understand that perception too. I'm good. In my heart, as I pastor people, I want to try and always live to a higher standard where I cannot possibly be wrong. And so I look at it and say, it's money I have in my checking account today that I did not yesterday. I believe you ought to tithe off the sale of your house. I believe if you bought a house for 100000 and you sell your house for 140000 you just made $40,000 profit. That's increase. I believe you ought to tithe $4,000. Uh, yeah, uh, I believe that's increase. See, we try and narrow down what increase is. Now, you, I don't think you ought to, on your birthday, I don't think you ought to go in and say, all right, I got, I got $65 worth of clothes. I know some people say you got to tithe $6.50. I think you ought to tithe off the cash money. We teach our children to tithe off the cash money that they get for their birthday. And there, there are increases increase. And I don't think we can take the commands of God too seriously. Now, if you say, I just don't agree with you, I don't tithe, I don't tithe off my tax return, I'm not going to fight with you about it. But I do believe that, the, that you cash out a 401k, you haven't tithed off that, I think you ought to tithe off that. Why? It's increase. You sell a house, I think you ought to tithe off the difference from what you bought to what you made. Uh, and you say, we ain't making much now. Uh, it, but you, it's increase. And I believe that's scriptural. Any other questions? Isn't talking about money great? <laughs> oh, yeah. Some of you are sitting there thinking, goodness sakes, I owe God lots of 20% right now. Anybody else? One more? Doesn't have to be on money. 
child rearing, marriage, anything, music, anything, anything. I see some of you thinking, we good? All right, let's look at our next lesson here. Good questions, by the way. The Psalm 5-8, you don't have to turn to. That's just up there from last week because I forgot to change it. But I want to talk to you tonight on abandonment of rewards. Abandonment of rewards. Do you know that God likes to give us stuff? Do you know God gave us incentives if we would just serve Him? And I'm going to give you five, the five crowns that we find in the Bible that we actually have opportunity to attain. But here, first in your notes, in God's kindness, He gave us an incentive program so that we would be more motivated to live for Him and serve Him while on earth. Now, God looks on the heart, man looketh on the outward. So God knows your motive. And to some who say motive doesn't matter, you ought to read your Bible. I'll let you study that out. I believe motive matters because uh, I may have the motive just to do it because Brother McCain's watching. And God knows why I'm doing that. God wants me to serve him for him. God wants me to serve him because I love him. And throughout our Christian life, next, there are many crowns that we can attain come judgment day. We will all stand before the Lord. Whether you stand before him saved or you stand before him unsaved, we will all stand before the Lord. Don't let there be any doubt in your mind. We'll all stand before the Lord. Uh, the, 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 the mighty will stand before the Lord. And those that are weak, the small will stand before the Lord. And the great, according to Revelation, we will all stand before the Lord. He is no respecter of persons. He doesn't care how much money you have. He doesn't care what your standing in the community is. He doesn't care what country that you were president of. Uh, he doesn't care if you got all the votes in a certain state. He doesn't care if you're Rick Santorum or Mitt Romney. He doesn't care who you are. He doesn't care if you're Muslim or Baptist or Mormon or president. He doesn't care. Everybody will stand before God. I will stand before God as a saved person. And I pray you will as well. But when I stand before God as a saved individual, I want to be able to win some of these crowns. You say, well, I, do, I don't do anything for rewards. Shut up. Don't try and be this holier than thou, high and mighty, well, I just do it because he loves me. That's why I do it too. And how dare you question or put into question my sincerity. I serve God too, but I want to earn one of these crowns. Why? Because this is how God's going to reward me. So it won't be standing before God saying, no, 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 that's not why I did it, God. You're going to be so silent, you're going to be on your face until he says stand up. So let's get away from this mentality. No, Paul even talks about a crown that he, that he earned because he fought a good fight and he kept the faith. Therefore is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. That's what Paul said. He wanted his crown. And I want some of these crowns. But more than I want, I want you to have them. I want us as a church to get crowns come judgment day. Let's look at the first crown. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. Uh, sorry, 4, verse 7 and 8. Paul writes, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. If you just stop at that verse right there, that's challenging enough. Fought a good fight. Isn't it something that he says what kind of fight? Good fight. So there are some things worth fighting for that maintain goodness. Good fight. I have, what's the next one? Finished. So he's fought and he's finished. We have so many people that quit. And boy, they've served in this ministry and now I'm done. No, don't quit. You're a bus captain, be a bus captain for 50 years. You're a bus uh, driver, be a bus driver until they won't uh, clear you with, what is it, your DOT card, your physical. You're, you're a Sunday school teacher, do it until your voice isn't strong enough or until you, or, or you can't see to study your lesson. But you can still sit in a class and teach them. You see, this idea of finishing ought to be bigger to us than it is. Finish. Finish. I just talked to the Kessels tonight about they've got to start thinking. Uh, they've got about 25 years till they're 70. When you're 70, what are you going to do? Are you going to stay in Africa or are you going to come home? What are you going to do? Now, we have those that retire. I don't question that. 
some retire for health. But we need, to, we need to begin thinking about it. We're so surprised often uh, by situations that come. My wife and I, we've talked. I can't tell you how many times that, that I have looked and said, Calvary Baptist Church deserves a better pastor with better health. And maybe, maybe God would want us to go and just maybe take a group of people, about 50 or 60, and just have the time of our life. It'd be a little, and you know what? That wouldn't be finishing. So guess what? I ain't going nowhere. We're going to have ourselves a time. And we're going to serve the Lord. I can do this with cancer. And if you'll be patient and we can serve the Lord together, my strength is made, or, or his strength is made perfect in my weakness. But together we can join our, our, our strength and we can do something great for the cause of Christ. Why? The ministry's not just the pastor. The ministry is the body of believers that he's assembled. And guess what? I want to finish. What about you? So don't make me have to try and talk you into finishing. Just purpose in your heart, I'm going to finish. Why? There's a crown involved. Uh, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. That's a big part of it, huh? How often do you almost lose your faith? You say, never. Seriously. We go through something and we start doubting. We start wondering, is it real? And all of a sudden Paul says, hey, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith henceforth. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. That love is appearing. He is talking about those who anticipate the arrival of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Your love is appearing. You're staying right with God. You're serving Him. You're working while it's day. You, 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 you are watching and you are ready and you're maintaining a state of readiness just like a soldier when he is in the field of battle. He maintains a state of readiness. Watching on all sides. And Paul says, a crown of righteousness. This is awarded to those who are living right before society, but also to those who are living right in their heart. Both inward and outward righteousness are required to receive this crown. That's why it's a crown of righteousness. You see, I was talking with some folks Sunday night about we, we live in a society, man, we, we look like everything's going good. But we sure jumble up this place. Our mind is filled with such uh, sin. Our mind is filled with such vanity. Our mind is filled with, we've defiled it. And we say, well, I'm righteous outwardly. And God says, I look on the heart. Living for God outwardly is important because my light needs to shine before men. But that's for men to see. My heart is what God sees. And so I ask you, when we look at the crown of righteousness, how are we doing? This righteousness is as defined by Scripture, not society. Well, I'm better than them. I'm better than them. Oh, look at them. At least I'm not walking out on a, uh, of a bar on Friday night. Yeah, but what are you doing at 2 a.m. on the computer when your whole family's sleeping? Yeah, you see... We, we compare righteousness with society. At least I'm not like them. Yeah, but why don't you try to be like him? Because when I try to be like him, all of a sudden everything changes. And my view and my opinion of righteousness is now to a higher standard than to the lower one that society creates. Number two, the second one is in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 24. As we talk, some of us have abandoned the idea of even attaining rewards. We say, well, as long as I make it to heaven. Whoa, we've abandoned this idea of obtaining rewards. I want the rewards because the rewards mean that I have pleased my Savior. I can get into heaven as saved and I'm doing nothing for him. Now, I think you ought to question your salvation if that's how you're living. But, but there are some that get so backslidden and they're stuck in carnality and they'll get to heaven and that's about it. But I want our church to obtain some of these rewards. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race, run all. He's talking about another competition. He just talked about fighting. I have fought a good fight. Now he's talking about running. Know ye not that they which run in a race, run all, but one receives the prize. That's why this new t-ball idea for all of our kids that everybody's a winner is a joke. 
I'm not being mean or callous, but what, if everybody's a winner, why in the world do I have to try to learn to hit a ball? If you strike out, you're a winner. Man, that's awesome. You got out 16 times today, but you're a winner. Dude, figure out how to hit the ball. I don't think we ought to yell at him, but I think we ought to challenge him. At the end of the game, you're giving everybody high fives. There ought to be a winning team and a losing team. At the end of a war, there ought to be a winner. There ought to be a winner. This idea of using our military, Brother Rosendale, for just policing another nation is craziness. That's why we have put a, a soldier in a situation to where he looks and his life is constantly in danger. I'm not for him murder, murdering innocent people, but I am for the fact that there comes a time, bring the troops home or let them fight. Amen. We look and we say, well, well, they're just, they're just keeping the peace. If they can't keep their own peace, then let them kill each other. But we look and we're, and, and, and we, we're, trying, we're trying to be these peacekeepers around the world. And Brother Rosen, it doesn't work. It really, it, we, we say it helps for a time. Then we leave. Then what happens, Iraq? And we, we, we have this same idea in, in our societies. And we're training our children. Well, everybody's a winner. And to a degree, I understand where some people would go with that, but then you have competitions and the kids start crying because they didn't get something. Yeah. Wrong. They're now crying at birthdays. Uh, I've watched people as they come to a birthday party and if the family has three kids, they bring three gifts. One for each kid. And we teach our children, hey, it ain't your birthday. You want to whine? Go up to your bedroom. You want to keep whining? You can wait for me up in your bedroom. Well, we're, we're training spoiled brats. We have a society that's not committed to anything. We don't try and work harder for the next rung on the ladder. We just look for a new company. Where's our loyalty? We, 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 we have this society, and Paul says, hey, but one receiveth the price, so run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. What's he saying? Every man has an individual race to run. He talks about a group, and he says, They that run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. Then in the next verse, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. And he narrows this thing down. Why do we race? Why are we running for Christ? To obtain the incorruptible crown. The incorruptible crown. This is also called the victor's crown. The race I run has nothing to do with the race Troy Tolley's running. If Troy stumbles and falls as a friend and a, a, a fellow Christian, I'll help, I'll dust him off, and let's get back up. But if Troy sits there and says, you know what, I'm tired of this. This is the third time I've fallen, and I'm done with this race. This is stupid. He starts pouting. I'm going to be like, God bless you. I did everything I can, and I'm going to keep running. Peter took some of those disciples with him when he chose not to keep running, remember? He said, I'm going to go fishing, and, they, and others followed. And they said, we're going to go with you. Now, thank God Peter came back to Christ, but you quitting, you stopping can affect other people. Don't let them, because I want to receive that victor's crown. I want to run. I want to run so fast that I just wake up in heaven one day and be like, whoo, how cool was that? I don't want to get to heaven one day and God finds me sitting on the sideline. Amen. The Super Bowl ring is so, man, it's, it's such a, a coveted thing in football. But the guys who are on the, on the bench don't get as many appearances on SportsCenter as the guys who are on the field. People want to talk to Peyton Manning right now because he's the guy on the field that changed the face of the Colts. And you know what? Uh, they want him. They're not talking about the third string quarterback. Then all of a sudden, the, the third-string quarterback of the Denver Broncos stepped up. He started running his own race, and now he's talked about all over and mocked by Tebow. Even have a friend who named his dog Tebow. But we want to obtain this victor's crown. We have all been enlisted into a race of some kind. And there are those who run for selfish gain and earthly applause, and they'll receive a corruptible crown. That's a crown that has no eternal value. You'll get the pat on the back from your friends. You'll get the kudos. You, 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 you'll get the honor here. 
but you get nothing there. It's not eternal, it's just temporal. However, there are those who are faithfully running this spiritual race and doing it for the Lord alone. These who run the spiritual race faithfully, keeping their body under subjection, will find themselves qualified as opposed to disqualified to win the victor's crown. And we should be able, when we get to heaven, to say, I ran that race that God challenged me to run. How do you know what the rules of the race are? Right here. The Bible. These are the rules of the race. You want to know how to disqualify yourself? Right here. God will tell you. You want to know how to qualify yourself? Right here. God will tell you. I want the victor's crown. I want the, righteous crown, the crown of righteousness. I want the victor's crown. Then we find number three in Revelation 2.10. In this great list of crowns. You ought to tape it in your Bible. Never forget it. Revelation 2 verse 10. We find here in Revelation 2 verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye uh, may be tried and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. Now, these are the passages I've been studying and as I've studied these, I find that each church, it, it, uh, each passage is a, addressed to the angel of the church. The angel is the pastor, the messenger of the church. But then he says at the very end of each uh, segment as he addresses these seven churches he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches you know that you know where it says that so I believe as I look here I believe that this crown of life is also the martyrs crown and if you go back to Hebrews you will find the hall of martyrs it's the hall of fame it's a bunch of people who he lists oh, well we have the hall of faith and then if you go to the next chapter he talks about these martyrs those who died for the cause of Christ I have not been imprisoned I have not uh, been beaten I have not been put in a place that uh, somebody's held a gun to my head and said you denounce Christ or I'll kill you I, I do not know if in my lifetime that I will be able to be put in that position to earn the martyr's crown I'm like you if I never have to face that I think I'd be okay however those who did faith it, uh, face it their Christianity was tried, tested, and their perseverance was far greater than ours. We have become a lackadaisical Christian uh, society. We throw Christian around, it's meaningless really. I can be a Christian and smoke uh, uh, 12 cigarettes a day. I can be a Christian and, and I can drink my beer at the end of the day as long as I'm in church on Sunday. Yeah, I'm a Christian too. Uh, that makes no sense to me since Christian means Christ-like. And can you just see Jesus with a Budweiser in his hand? I can't. Yet you'll have a priest who'll go. Um, as a matter of fact, our new high priest in Baltimore now, I forget what, it, what that, a cardinal? Is that what he is now? What is he? A cardinal, I think. And boy, he went to the Vatican, and guess what he did when he came back? He not only greeted the people, but then he had a beer with them. Hmm. That's great. Makes a lot of sense considering the Bible talks about that, those intoxicating drinks. By the way, he did not turn water into an intoxicating wine. So don't let an ignorant society teach you an ignorant belief. He would never do anything to be contrary to the Word of God. He would never do anything to violate the very common law uh, of the Jewish nation, which at that time it was a disgrace to be found drunk in the city. We're like, hello, we're trying to make rules uh, and we're trying to blame God so we feel better about ourselves. The cardinal should never be drinking. That's why we don't use real wine for communion. Shocked, huh? Some of you thought it was just a little glass of wine. Yeah, we have folks that have asked if they could bring big mugs. We don't let that happen. But we have the crown of life. It's the martyr's crown. A martyr is one who gave his life for a cause. David, uh, David uh, was willing to die for the cause when he asked his brothers, if you remember, is there not a cause? He hears Goliath uh, yelling out there, send me a man that I may fight against him. And, and he says, if he wins, we'll serve you. If I win, uh, then uh, yeah, if, uh, if you win, we'll serve you. If he wins, vice versa, you know what I'm saying. 
And David looks and he sees all these big mighty men. He's a teenager here. And he sees all these mighty men with their armor on hiding in their tents. And he says, hold on. Is there not a cause? Will nobody stand up for, for the name of God? It's a holy name. God will fight for us. And his brothers said, well, why are you here? Why are you here? You're just here to make a scene. You're just here to make us feel stupid. And we look and, we, and we, we know the story how Saul was also hiding and Saul was their leader standing head and shoulders above every man in Israel, puts his armor on David who was but a ruddy youth. And David said, I, I can't do this. I've not proved this armor. So he takes five smooth stones and a sling and he runs directly at the problem. Uh-oh. Didn't we just talk about that crown? They that run in a race run all, so run that ye may obtain. He didn't run away, he ran toward. Even though he had brothers, his own family, were telling him, go back, David. Thank you for the cheese balls and crackers, but go back. You just came to see what was going on and be nosy. Now go home. And David said, wrong. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? And I ask you today, is there not a cause? There are many who have and many who will give their lives for the cause of Christ. There is coming a day where martyrdom will take place again. I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom, just a realist. The days are coming. In our society where they're making laws and they have, they have uh, petitions before our Senate and our Congress right now to outlaw the King James Bible as a hate crimes book, let me tell you, there'll be days of imprisonment coming. So you just better get set on it. Now, they may not come in some of your lifetime, but I believe they'll come in mine. And we look and we say, well, well, I didn't know it was this serious. Yeah, isn't Christianity great when it's comfortable? But what about when your feet are literally put to the fire? We could take you back into the Fox's Book of Martyrs and the actual recordings of men and women, mothers, fathers being burnt at the stake, uh, wives being literally skinned in front of their husbands, and their husbands telling, hey, we'll stop this, we'll stop torturing your wife if you will simply recant Christ. And they found there was a cause greater than family, Christ. Amen. Christ. And they died for his cause. And I look at our society today, and Brother Sasser, sometimes I wonder if our younger leadership in our, young, in, in, in our churches and in our society, would they be willing to stand for Christ? They're willing to compromise in their music. They're willing to compromise in their stand for the King James Bible. They're willing to compromise in their standards. They're willing to compromise in their speech. Would they be willing to compromise for Christ? You see, if you take a watered-down approach, you're going to have a watered-down stand. And there's going to come a time when the backbone will, will be tested of the leaders for Christ in America. And as we stand, I can't tell you that I'll stand faithful. I plan on it. I, I pray that I will. But when they start putting my kids and my family before me, I'm going to have to do a reality check, and I'm going to have to pray my wife stands strong, and I have to pray my children stand strong. Why? As I preach Sunday, my citizenship's in heaven. I'll see him on the other side, and they may not want to get to heaven that way, but God says, hey, to the martyr, I'm going to reward you. I'm going to give you a crown. You say, it's not, a crown isn't worth it to me. A crown given by Christ is worth it. To find out that your heavenly father said, I'm proud of you. It's worth it. Are you willing to stand? We've got this idea that, well, as long as this song talks about Christ, then, I'll, then I think it's okay. And we, we act like the end justify the means, and it doesn't. Uh, uh, John Getch made a statement, and he said, when, when our ideology, when our idea of just reaching anybody and everybody takes more precedent than our stand for doctrine, we will soon compromise. And that's what happened with Jerry Falwell. Jerry Falwell said, My, I, I, I want to I reach hundreds of thousands of people, and in order to do that, I've got to change my doctrine. And you know what happens when you change your doctrine? You get to your late 80s, and you make this statement to USA Today, I don't really believe that hell's literal. Yeah. So what kind of gospel are you preaching then? 
When your idea is to fill up a Coliseum every Sunday at Lakewood Church and, and you say, I need to have about a, a 27 to 37,000 people every Sunday just to keep the lights on, then all of a sudden my stand is no longer doctrinally sound, but I want to tell people about Jesus. And when you all of a sudden care more about keeping the lights on at the church than you do about the doctrine of God's Word, you will slide. And when you get on national television, you won't have the guts to say that homosexuality is a sin. You won't have the guts to say, yes, there's only one way to heaven, and it's through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we see that, and we're often shocked. How come they won't say it? Because they are so focused on the multitude rather than being focused on Christ and his doctrine. If I am focused on Christ, I'll reach who Christ wants me to reach, and I'll do it his way. And guess what? Our church is growing, and our music is old-fashioned. Our stand is old-fashioned. I don't want to look like the world. I want to live in the world, but I don't want to be of the world. And we say, well, believe in Jesus dressed like the world. Their standard of modesty back in that day was so far superior to ours. Immodesty was only something the harlots did. Our idea of modesty today, you cannot compare the two. Our idea of modesty is women showing their cleavage. And we call it modest. It's not modest. Cover yourself up. And we, we go through, we, we have this idea, and I look and I say, could we really obtain the martyr's crown if persecution started tonight? If the doors burst open, how many would, ab would abandon ship? Go grab the kids and run for fear. And I ask you, is what you believe worth dying for? Let's keep going. Here we go. It's quiet now. We find 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And verse number 13. Let us look. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. By the way, as I read this this morning, I thought about the King James issue. We're so quick in our society today to say, well, it's just another book. But we believe it's of God. Is that not what this verse is saying? We thank God without ceasing because when we receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men. This isn't man's book, though God used men. He used holy men of God who spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. But we received it as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, talking to the saved, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, that they might be saved, to fill up their sin always, sins alway, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time, in presence, not in heart, endeavored more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are, uh, for ye are our glory and joy. And we find the crown of rejoicing. I believe, as, and as I've studied, I believe this to be true. The crown of rejoicing is also referred to as a soul winner's crown. This is that soul winner's crown. We take this book because we believe it to be true, and we shine it uh, into the life, uh, onto the life of another and say, hey, God says because of sin you deserve to go to hell, and so do I. But because of his grace and mercy, you don't have to. You get to go to heaven. We also find that in Daniel chapter, I believe it's chapter 12, uh, when you go and you find uh, when he's referring, and we talked about it uh, several uh, months ago when we were in our Daniel study. The soul winner's crown. 
It is not specific just how many people one must lead to Christ in order to get this crown, but I believe it is given to those who are watchful and ready to speak to others about eternity in heaven. Who have you told about Christ? By the way, this crown is one that God wants every one of his uh, children to receive because we're all commanded to soul win. And so this is a crown that every one of us should uh, be working on receiving in heaven. The soul winner's crown, this crown uh, of rejoicing. And as we look at the rejoicing, the Bible says there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner that comes to repentance. Remember, soul winning causes heaven to rejoice. So as we look at the soul winner's crown, if you've ever led somebody to Christ, it causes you to rejoice. It's never, a, it's never a nonchalant, yeah, well, yeah, I had somebody saved today. No, when you come back and you say, man, I had somebody saved today. Yeah. Rejoicing. And God says, I, want, I have a crown prepared, and I want to give that to you if you will obey. But we look and we say, well, I just don't know if I can. It's a command, not a gift. To go soul winning is a command. You need to go do it. And as you go, you say, I don't know what to say. Tell somebody else what Jesus did to you. What he did for you. Say, I don't, I don't know really all that happened, but uh, I know I'm saved. Well, what does that mean? And then take the back of your track and say, well, like it says here, first, you got to recognize your condition and read it. I've watched some of our teenagers when I was a youth pastor uh, stand at a door. This one guy, his name was John. I'm trying to think of his last name. He, he was one of those, he was an awkward, backward teenager. Sweetest spirit you'd ever, you'd ever uh, uh, find. And he said, he said, Brother Cameron, can I go soul winning with you tonight? And I took him soul winning. And I said, all right. After about six, seven doors, I said, you're next. He said, no, 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 no. I said, you're next. And I knocked on the door. <laughs> I knocked on the door, and I stepped away, and I pushed him right in front of it. And he's standing there. He had a hard time talking to anybody. And he said, I don't know what to do. And I said, well, number one, don't cry. Number two, read the track. <laughs> the door opened. And a lady answered the door, and he just said, ma'am, you've got to recognize your condition. And he started going through it. Not a how do you do. You want to talk about doing it right, wrong? He did it all wrong. And he got down to the end where it says on here, he said, let us help you word of prayer. Realize it's not a prayer that saves, but it is your faith in Jesus. And he just started going through the prayer. When he started reading the prayer, she started repeating it. When she started repeating it, he looked back at me like, she's, she's repeating it. <laughs> when it was all done, he got down, Jesus' name, amen. He said, thank you. And he went to walk away. And when he went to walk away, I said, John, whoa, whoa, hold on. I said, ma'am, I'm so happy for your decision tonight. And she said, you know, that was so sincere. She said, I really do believe that. And I got to give her assurance of her salvation right at the door. We walked away. You know what John could not stop doing? Talking about it. <laughs> he, he started rejoicing. There's something about leading the soul to Christ. Some of you who've never had a smile on your face, tell somebody about Jesus. Some of you who used to smile a lot and you haven't smiled, I mean, your face would crack if you did type thing. You ought to try this. It'll change your life. And you could get a crown for it. Number five, and lastly, 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And I'm moving quick. I know it's getting late. We've got to go eat cake really quick. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. And verse number 1 through 4. The, uh, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being uh, in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. We find lastly the crown of glory. Some have referred to this as the pastor's crown. I don't know that that is specifically for pastors. I, as I look and I read it here, it says, uh, the elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder. 
I believe that this is talking in here. I believe that this could mean the teachers, deacons, staff, missionaries, and evangelists, those who sincerely lead the flock of God toward righteousness. If you're a bus captain tonight, you're pastoring a small group of people. That's why it's so important you stay faithful to that bus route. If you're teaching children uh, in our ministry, you, you, you are leading people. You are pushing them that lead the flock of God. If you're in the nursery, boy, he was so emphatic about suffer the little children to come unto me. Don't take your ministry lightly. I believe this crown of, of glory has everything to do with those that lead the people of God. Daniel talks about that as well when he's talking about the stars and he's talking about so many things. So we look and, and you say, well, I just go to the jail. No, you're pastoring a group of people. And you're leading a group of people. That word pastor, it has to do with overseer. You're overseeing something. Now, we know there's one pastor for a church, and, and all the ministries fall under the leadership. And I, and I take that responsibility very, very uh, sincerely, and I, uh, very, it's very uh, important to me. But at the same time, I don't want to hoard every ministry. I can't preach everywhere. Every Friday night at 7 o'clock, you're leading a group of people. But under you got a lot more people leading more people. And it trickles down. Well, I want that crown of glory. I want, Brother Sasser, as we reach out to the Jewish community and as you go to other churches, I believe there's a crown of glory waiting for you. As Brother Scott uh, is out uh, preaching and, and uh, 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 through the evangelism, I believe a crown of glory is going to be waiting for him. As you teach in our Christian school, I believe there's a crown of glory waiting for you. As you work on a bus route, as you drive that bus, if you're influencing the people of God toward Christ, I believe a crown of glory is waiting for you. Don't ruin it. Don't ruin it. We see lastly, I put this here, can I lose my reward? In Matthew 6, 1 and 2, you can go and study this out, but I'll read it. I have it right here. It says, take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. If you're only doing it for the praise of the people around you, that's the reward you have. You're done. If you were to jump over, you don't have to, but I'm, I'm there right now. If, you, if we were to go over to 2 John uh, chapter, uh, 2 John, sorry, 2 John verse 8, I think it is. Uh, the, yes, verse 8, it says, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Can you lose them? Yes. You can lose them. It's when you stop serving God. Can you get them back? Yep. If you're carnal tonight, step back up to the plate and say, I'm back in. I want to get back in the game. I want to get back in the race. I want to fight a good fight again. Get back. There are many more rewards that I can earn and treasures that can be laid up in eternity for me. However, they will be tried by fire and it will be discovered if I did it for the glory of God or the glory of self. You can look at 1 Corinthians 3.13 later. But it talks about our works being tried in the fire. Some will come forth with everlasting gold, silver, the precious. They'll come forth. They'll make it through. But some will be burned up like wood, hay, and stubble. I ask you tonight, have you abandoned seeking those rewards? Maybe you've never heard about them. God is watching. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, our invitation will be brief tonight, but as we do every Wednesday, I'd like to start by asking this question. If you died tonight, do you know for sure that you'd go to heaven? You say, I don't. If I died tonight, I don't know for sure that heaven would be my home, but I'd like to know. If that's you, would you slip your hand up? I'm the only one looking. Is there anybody like that? Pastor, pray for me. I don't know that I'd go to heaven, but I'd sure like to. By our testimony, we're all saved tonight. Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, i got to get back on track. It's not about pleasing pastor. It's not about pleasing family or people. It's about pleasing God. I've got to get back on track. I've got to. I'm going to pray and we're going to stand. If that's you, let's just use the altar tonight. Father, we love you so much. I pray that you'd bless this invitation in Jesus' name.
Amen. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, let's stand together. Would you use the altar with me tonight? Would you use the altar with me tonight? And as you do, let's just pray for a minute. Say, I'm not doing what I should. You can start again. Start today. Start serving God. Don't let, don't let anybody hinder you from serving God. You will not stand before Jesus with a crowd. You'll stand before Jesus all alone. Your friends that support you and you're wrong now, it ain't going to matter come judgment day. So stop looking at everybody around you for your support. Look to him. How do you make it through a daughter having leukemia? By looking toward Christ. How do you make it through a mother dying in her sleep? By looking at Christ. How do you make it through the difficulties that you face? Looking to Christ. Those tonight that find themselves overwhelmed, how do you make it? Christ. It's all about Christ. It's always been about Christ. How do the martyrs make it being burned at the stake? They kept their faith in Christ. How could a mother watch her children be let out into a coliseum to be ripped and shredded? You say, that's just so disgusting. It is, but it happened. How can they do that? Christ. It's not about self. It's not about how macho somebody is. It's not about how wise somebody is. Is there not a cause? Yes, there is. And the cause is great. And God takes notice. Jesus came to die that we might have a purpose and that we might have a place in heaven. Father, I thank you for the many who've prayed here at the altar, there at their seat. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us, that we would not abandon the rewards that God has for us for earthly pleasure and gain. Eternity is an awful long time. We could store up all kinds of treasure here on earth. But as one preacher said, we've never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. We aren't taking anything with us. So help us to lay treasure up on the other side. Lord, I pray that we'd live our life for Thee. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, when you're done at the front, you can return. Father, what a night we've had in church, and I pray that you take us home safely. But before we leave, I pray that we'd make our way up to uh, Lane Hall and that we'd welcome Brother Rosendale back and thank him for his service to our great country. And Lord, thank you for his safety. Bless tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.